Good morning and welcome to the first paper session of this year's symposium. This morning we will have four paper presentations, 30 minutes each. I am pleased to welcome our first speakers from Singapore, pianist Abigail Sin and composer-conductor Su Win Lok. Uh, also on their team was mezzo-soprano Jade Tan Shi Yu, but she is unfortunately not with us today. The title of their talk this morning is Artfully Interrupting the Fantasy, Reimagining Ravel's Azie. I'm already intrigued from the title. Will you please tell us more about your work? Hey, good morning, everyone. And thank you so much uh, for having us today. Um, I'm Abigail. I'm a pianist from Singapore. I'm at the Young Sido Conservatory of Music. And so when would like to introduce yourself? I am Su Win, uh, I'm a composer and conductor. I am currently in New York, so it's 11 p.m. here and excited to share this evening with you all. Okay, I'm just gonna, sorry, just gonna share my screen and, and start the presentation. Okay, oops, I'm sorry. Okay, so the title of our presentation today is Artfully Interrupting the Fantasy reimagining Ravel's Aziz. I'd like to just start by sharing an anecdote from one of our first rehearsals of, of this song. So at one point, you know, we were three of us in a room and, and Jade, we just looked at each other and Jade asked, is it okay for us to even like this music? Because we love Ravel's sound worlds, but as musicians from Asia, specifically Singapore, in the year 2021, singing words about an Asia reduced to stereotypes and stock characters like fat mandarins and shady merchants and murderers, well, that just feels insulting and wrong. So we took the last line of Klingzor's text for this song as inspiration for this project. We seek to artfully interrupt this Orientalist fantasy by confronting it with sounds and visual images from our vision of Asia. In this presentation today, I'm going to talk about how Jade, the mezzo-soprano and instigator of this project, conceptualized this project and got so in me and Mahan Kumami Poor, an Iranian filmmaker on board. We will share our strategies for interrupting the fantasy with sound and with visual images. And we'll show you three to four excerpts um, from our project. And then finally, we'll show you the completed music video, which we released in April this year. So how this song, how this project was conceptualized. Um, well, this project came about largely because of the pandemic. Uh, concert halls were shut and the digital platform was kind of the only way we could share our work. And so we wanted to explore how this digital format with its different tools, electronic soundscapes, videography and animation um, could present a complex art song like RZ more vividly and more artistically. We wanted to reimagine and reclaim this song through our lenses as 21st century Singaporean musicians. So in August 2020, Jade and I recorded this song in Ravel's own reduction for voice and piano. Su Win was on board right from the beginning as we began to plan how we might take the text and Ravel's orchestration as a launching point for how we might reimagine re and design our own sound world. I think the project really took on new life when Mahan came aboard at the end of 2020. And talking to him um, and discussing our plans for the animation, we really just highlighted how ludicrous it was to reduce Asia into stock characters and stereotypes. Um, Asia is not a single idea. We are all from Asia, but we have experienced very different lives in Asia. And we have very different experiences of Western colonialism. Someone from a Singaporean Chinese has a very exp different experience of that from someone in, who lives in modern day Iran. So he really added a new perspective to this interpretation of the song as seen through the lens of someone who currently lives in the Middle East. So how did we interrupt the Orientalist fantasy of Ravel's Azi? Firstly, with sound, we set out to reimagine Ravel's orchestral score. We replaced the timbres of the Western Symphony Orchestra with timbres of traditional Asian instruments, which the Western timbres were merely attempting to imitate. We also incorporated elements from nature, like the sound of waves and seabirds and the wind. So the orchestra timbres were also just attempts to capture and translate the essence of those, of those natural elements into music. So these were gathered from a library of sounds and timbres and Sobin programmed them to match the timing and the nuances of the voice and piano recording. 
We also interrupted the fantasy with visual images. We used cutouts from actual Persian miniatures and we animated them. Mahan and his team also drew transitional scenes in a similar style. So we have this mix of old authentic images from Persian miniatures and this hand-drawn images with the same style and same kind of motifs. The ending scene was also quite um, important. We switched from these animated images to footage of our actress friend Nilo, who's also from Iran, waking up in her apartment, starting her day with the radio on, hearing news from all over the world. So this idea of confronting the fantasy with reality. I'd like to show you um, our first musical excerpt, which is actually how we found our launching point for the entire approach to the song. So this is the section of the art song where the protagonist sings about China. And with this section, when we heard it, it was immediately obvious to us, oh, partly because Soin has a background in traditional Chinese music, it was obvious to us that the musical language of this section is a caricature. It's an attempt to mimic elements of traditional Chinese music with Western instruments. And we quickly realized that we did not want to merely digitally replicate Ravel's orchestration, but to reimagine the inspiration behind these sound worlds and reclaim that. So when would you like to tell us more about how you put in the different layers? So as we explored this whole Chinese aspect uh, of Ravel's Azi, uh, we, we saw from both from the text and from the music, we understand that she's actually visiting a, a palace. And so we had these elements of uh, Chinese palace music we call Gong Ting Yin Yue. Uh, so you will hear elements such as the sheng, the wind instrument, the little uh, pipe organ that you see at the bottom there uh, performed in the background, uh, which is actually playing originally uh, what Ravel wrote in the horns. And it's this really quintal quarter kind of elements in there. And then you also hear, we also took from the vernacular of Chinese opera. So you hear the uh, percussive rhythms from cymbals and gongs like chang che, chang che. Uh, we added these little bits of things to enhance the whole flavor, which we felt that uh, would actually have been what would have been appropriate if, if Ravel knew uh, Chinese music. And similarly, the, the woodwind lines are, that was originally from uh, Ravel's orchestration in the flutes are now allocated to the Yang Qing because we can see that the figure that he wrote tita, 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 is very much of a plug string kind of idiom. So we put it, put it to the Yang Qing, which is a, actually a hammered dulcimer. And I, and I think uh, in Thailand, you have that similar instrument, the Kim as well. Yeah. So that's, uh, this is how we approach the Chinese part. And it's also, this concept of approaching the uh, cultural elements of a, of a certain region is something we extrapolate to apply to the other parts of ASEAN as well, such as the, the Persian elements where I consulted Mahan. So I think, Abby, you would like to show them a little excerpt of it. You can you first see a, a little glimpse of how the, how the whole session looks like. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, this, this is not so impressive. Watch the video. <laughs> So that's the excerpt. Sorry, so that's the excerpt um, from China, where she sings about China. And so we applied this approach of reinterpreting the inspiration behind Ravel's sound world to the opening of the song as well, where we create the world of the dream. So in Ravel's score, we have this like shimmering effect in the violins. And perhaps it's evoking the idea of starlight. You know, she's dreaming at night. And we also hear this melody in the oboe, which is the same melodic motif as the section um, that when she sings about Persia. So perhaps it might be imitating a shawm, but at this point, the main character is not entirely sure what she's hearing. It's like she's hearing a beckoning call from a distant land. So when you want to talk about the treatment? Yeah, so as we reimagine uh, Azi for our modern era, we, we approach it from how how a, a modern composer, sound designer will approach it and uh, in invoking what Ravel wanted to paint, which is uh, you hear sounds of 
I wouldn't say sounds of stars, but like, you know, cricket, something that conjures up an imagery of the night. So it, it puts the audience immediately in the zone, so to speak. Uh, and what uh, Abigail mentioned just now about the oboe, perhaps being a strong, we, we went for a little, uh, it's a kind of foreshadowing of a compound timbre where you don't really know. So we use, we program uh, the shom and also a Chinese xiao stack together along with an, uh, an oboe as well. Uh, to create a very ambiguous kind of timbre. So let's hear a bit of how it sounds. <laughs> So in the next section, when she sings about sailing away and embarking on her journey to Asia, we thought, you know, what if we actually had waves instead of violas and cellos like Ravel's orchestration? Because just as Ravel's orchestration in the part about China is a translation of what he perceives to be Chinese music, well, these figurations in the violas and in cellos are also an attempt to capture the essence of waves breaking against the side of the boat and him trying to translate that feeling into music. So shall I show, let me, uh, so you talk about the waves or shall I just show the excerpt? I think we could let and listen to a little excerpt of it. Yep, okay. Let's just hear how the waves sound like. Oh, no, sorry, it's... Uh... Sorry, the, I think the... Sorry, apologies for that. I think the we lost the we lost the where yeah, the, the time was. The time, uh, yeah. Okay. But I think that was a, so that was the, a good uh, example. Yeah. yeah. All right. So the this final excerpt that I want to show you is the climax of the piece itself. Um, and this is like the emotionally the most cathartic moment of the piece. And it's also a moment where we thought it's it just sums up her entire journey. Uh, so we really like to tell us about the timbre here. So over here, it's really, uh, this whole part was my giant playground. I was so looking forward to working on this part uh, as I was working on this project. And when it came to this part, before, uh, as we were working on this project, Mahan, uh, Abigail, and uh, Jade and I, we were all discussing about sense of identity and Asia, and Asia being a singular identity in uh, Ravel's and Klingor's vision. Uh, and and in trying to embody this, I, I felt this was one big moment to truly bring that out. And while Ravel's orchestration utilized a big, massive brass fanfare for the melody lines, uh, what we actually did for this was to stack the shom, the, uh, the Persian shom, the Indian bansuri, the Chinese suona, the Japanese sheng, and all sorts of different woodwind instruments into one giant compound timbre. It, it, it sounds very, uh, I would say, it's very, it's a very intense sound, much more than uh, what a normal symphony orchestra could give you. And this goes back to the whole blurring of uh, identity and the whole ambiguity of things. And uh, beneath that, also all the texture from Ravel's strings, you will hear what uh, we use uh, the, the Chinese guzheng, the zeta, and also different forms of zeta from uh, Japan and Korea as well, all different samples stacked below to create this whole giant compound timbre. And I think we wouldn't give it away to you right now to let you hear this climax, but we will present the whole video to you. So let's listen to it.
Okay, well, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed that video. Um, so these are just some of the ways that we've reimagined and reclaimed Ravel's Asia for ourselves, interrupting the fantasy with sounds and images from our vision of Asia. Um, I think there's, there's certainly potential for exploring more of the Western classical canon in this manner, adopting this outlook of artistic reimagining and recoloring through our contemporary lenses and local context. Perhaps by mixing in sounds from other genres like our friends uh, JJ Pris and Stephanie will do in the next uh, segment. So um, thank you for listening and we look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. That was just absolutely beautiful. Um, bravi to you both and also to Jay Tan for this wonderful work. I really, really enjoyed it so much. And there's so much creativity also in the sound design and in the concept and the filming and just visually, it's so beautiful as well. And indeed, the climax was really, really powerful. And yeah, I just enjoyed it so much. Um, yeah, for me, I, I, think, yeah, uh, I think it's so interesting how you combine kind of two different traditions, if we speak about traditions. So one is classical music, or what we call classical music um, with Ravel's song, but then also traditional music as in traditional Asian music, and you're bringing them into dialogue. And I think these kinds of confrontations are so important and useful, especially in our times. Um, so yeah, I would like to invite the participants if, if anyone has any comments they would like to add or questions. I see there are two chats maybe. Do we have any questions from, the, from our participants? Uh, yes, please feel free to type in anything you would like to say. Um, in the meantime, uh, maybe I can ask a couple of things. Um, first, I'd like to ask, because something that's been emerging, I'm sorry, are you with us, Abigail? It seems like you're frozen. Yep. Okay. Yes, I am. Okay. 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 Great. Okay, you're back. Um, so something that's been emerging in this symposium, um, also from the talks yesterday, was this idea that Yes, we, we have differences, but also there are some shared similarities between cultures that are seemingly different or seemingly par far apart. Um, especially uh, one of the keynote speakers yesterday, they were, they were speaking on this issue that uh, we may not really think about it or expect it, but actually there are so many um, ancient uh, traditions that we have in common. Uh, even, even through cultures, even in cultures that are spread apart very geographically far. Um, so as musicians, I would like to ask how, how do you think is a good balance of navigating um, the act of celebrating differences versus acknowledging or finding commonalities? What do you think our role is as, as musicians? Maybe I can take this question. Mm -hmm. So I really feel that um, art music is something that is very relevant to the people. I mean, the, the main thing about art and music is, is creating some thinking or feeling in people, empathy. And for that to happen, I think art and culture and music has to evolve with the times and stay relevant. We, we should never be preservation for the sake of preservation. So I think in this age, there are actually no boundaries to how we explore what we can do. Uh, uh, some An artist from Thailand can go to India and then work on a collaboration there and then take it to Japan and then like infuse new ideas in there. And I think the, what I like that you mentioned is uh, how can we still have that form of balance. So while I say that there are no boundaries, I think uh, it's up to the artist to make a, a very good effort in trying to understand the culture and traditions and the and the original art form that she or he is uh, deriving from. So if you if you are working on a collaboration with a, with a tabla player, uh, I think it's it's really up to you to really understand uh, where does the tabla come from, the history of it, what can it do, what are some of the idiomatic things it does, uh, are there any certain significance, uh, religious, ritualistic significances to its music before you embark on your. It, it makes it helps you to have a much more informed. Uh, collaboration after all. So yeah, that would be my take on it. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with what Soin said 100%. And in this particular project, it was Mahan actually who introduced us to the world of Persian miniatures and actually telling us that in Persian miniatures, they do depict um, people in China and India because there was of course vibrant trade between all these cultures. And so we, instead of just, you know, drawing a, a 
fantasy version of these cultures, we could actually go to the source material itself and look at how uh, the Persian people actually viewed those cultures through their art. And so that was really educational for all of us. Mm, yeah, that's wonderful. And I really like how through this, through this educational experience, it's also inspiring in a, in a, it enhances our fantasy too. And I mean, even from this work, as you mentioned, it is a fantastical work. It is Ravel's imagination of Asia, but it's now um, through your work, you are including so many more perspectives to kind of add to the fantasy, but a fantasy that's rooted in reality as well. So I really love this dialogue between um, the imagined and the real. And yeah, I think you just did such an amazing job of putting all of that together and synthesizing. And so we, we just really appreciate your work so much. Um, yeah, do you have any final words or things to add before we finish here? I would say uh, if you can check it out on YouTube with your headphones, your speakers, I think a lot of work goes into the performance nuances between Shi Yu and Abigail, and as well on the uh, sound design and composing additional layers part. So really be immersed, and I think, uh, yeah, try uh, share your thoughts, comment on it. I think it's, uh, we, we hope that this work sparks more ideas and more discussions for future things. Mm. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think that's so important to note also in our day and age that we're receiving a lot of music online or uh, yeah, through recordings, right, rather than the live performance. So we need to um, experience it in a new way, um, but be, being open to uh, new creations and new types of works. So thank you so much for exposing us to, to your creative work. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so for our next speakers, um, also from Singapore, uh, is everyone with us here today? Yes, I, um, I do believe so. <laughs> okay, so from, also from Singapore, we have multi-genre singer, songwriter, and producer, Lin Jingjie, and uh, we have clarinetist Stephanie Tan, and is Priscilla Fong also here? Um, Priscilla will not really be joining us for this session as she is currently um, engaged in another appointment. Um, so today, the, uh, uh, it's mainly going to be presented by me and Stephanie. Ah, yeah. I see. All but right. she was nonetheless a very integral part of creating this project. Yeah. Okay, yes. So today, you'll be speaking about your work, Claire de Lune, a musical yes. film exploration of the 21st century musician identity. Please yes. take it away. All righty. Thank you so much. So um, hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for tuning into this presentation and thank you to uh, Abigail and Suwin for that really <laughs> generous and really kind introduction. Um, my name is Lim Jingjie, I'm a recent graduate and now a teaching assistant at the Yong Siu Conservatory of Music and also the creative director and music producer of the project Claire de Lune Reimagined, a musical film exploration of the 21st century musician. It might be also worth noting as well at this point that much of the genesis of this project uh, began as an exercise during a mentorship consultancy session with the conservatory, which the conservatory offers to a number of its younger faculty members. Uh, with the guidance of my mentor, Topi Latipu, this project commenced as so. Today, myself and my teammates, Stephanie Tan and Priscilla Fong, both of whom are YSC alumni as well, would be presenting the film and also talking a little bit about the artistic process of creating this work, as well as the boundaries of tradition which we sought to break and evolve from. So as an introduction, uh, Claire Deline Reimagined is a musical film which fuses Western classical music with synth wave, a revival genre of 1980s synth pop. Centered around Debussy's Claire de Lune from Fête Galante, written for voice and piano, the film is about a protagonist who seeks reconciliation with the disguises and realities from their truth, much like what is reflected in Claire de Lune. The execution of this project brings us one step further by allowing us to reimagine the possibilities of how we think and relate to music, and therefore musicians' identities, all of which have been evolving faster than ever during the uncertainties of the 21st century. Much of this project tries to answer the bigger question, how do we tell our story? 
How do we give the stories we tell a much more Singaporean or Southeast Asian spin, or perhaps even a more personal spin? But perhaps before we dive in on the hows, we also need to kind of understand the whys. Uh, why should we tell our story? Why should we concern ourselves with reimagining the Western classical tradition? And what provides us with the impetus to innovate and reframe our construction of musician identities? There are three broad reasons for this. The first being a much required contextualization through current sociopolitical lenses. In a paper entitled Reflection of Philosophy on Art and Philosophy of Art by Susan and Mamour in 2014, it is stated that music questions and interprets the problematic on human, nature, and universe through its unique methods. On a greater level, this film seeks to comment on the pristine curatedness of Singaporean life. But along with this, the engagement of this project begs us to reassess our relationship as Singaporeans with Western classical music, a genre rooted in a tradition that is not native to our own. Thus, in order to circumvent this, we could evolve from tradition to present a story in a new light, one which could be more innate and in interconnected to our own society. Secondly, this project seeks to build continued relevance and progress towards the discipline of music. In utilizing tradition as the basis of any kind of reimagination, it allows the space and capacity for the transitory to exist. But even greater so, it pays homage to conventions, as you do need to know the rules before you learn how to break them. One could argue that in the global pandemic, reflections on relevance and progress become even more salient, especially through the absence of the live music experience. In presenting the work as a film, we seek to innovate the experiential and performative elements of music, which could in turn result in a greater reach through a more familiar medium of communication, uh, responding to the changes of our time. And then this brings me to my third point. In order to innovate, we also have to collaborate, enabling a world of possibilities for creativity within and beyond music. Music has to concern itself in relation with other disciplines like film, theater, and media. Musicians either collaborate with other artists or start to harness and develop other dual identities, which reshapes and reframes what it means to be Western classically trained. So through the working of this project, uh, there is much stylistic fluidity to offer. For example, I personally merge my classical singing identity with 80 synth pop music production identities into one cohesive work. Um, the, the hyphenated identity of a musician also begins to appear, especially as musicians dabble with the multi and interdisciplinary, merging different non-musician roles like cinematography and videography, as with the case of Stephanie, who is a clarinetist by training, and Priscilla, a singer by training, but with a deeply musical perspective and way of reflection in order to achieve their own endeavors. With the transitions of traditions and the changes to the industry and the greater world, so will the definition of traditional job roles start to transit and evolve too, formulating what could be the 21st century musician identity. Perhaps the next question to ask ourselves is, why this composer? Why this work as a starting point? It comes with no surprise that WC was as well a proponent of collaborative work of his time, and certainly no stranger to the interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary world. His iconic symphonic poem, Prelude to the Afternoon of a Fawn, composed in 18, 1894, is one such example, exploring a sense of sonority that pays homage to Stéphane Mallarmé's original poem of the same title, and yet evolves out of its origins to tell a story that is of a different dimension and medium nonetheless. In a research entitled Debussy, Beyond Black and White by Stephen Emerson and Bernard Lansky, who was the beloved professor that inspired much of the beginnings of this project, it is known that Debussy remained open to interpretive approaches towards his music, being more concerned with the imaginative than the substance of realized sonority. The case of Claire de Lune as a valid starting point, therefore kind of exhibits a stronger, uh, stronger substantiation, being a song that was written based on a poem of the same name by Paul Verlain, which was in turn based on Jean-Antoine Watteau's category of paintings also known as Fête Galante. Therefore, the exploration of evolutionary identities and aesthetics within the field of Western classical music is well justified. So, how do we tell our story? The artistic process of this work consists of four main parts. The first being the thematic considerations of the story. 
The Fat Galant poems are based off a series of artworks done by Watteau in the 18th century Rococo style that were based off a late Baroque pastoral masquerade, also known as the Fête Champêtre. Beyond the frivolous and elaborate entertainment form also lies questions in truth and reality, which were noted both in the paintings and the poems, stemming from an incongruence of states of mind for which this project has sought to address. In Claire de Lune, there is much mention of social ambiguity and conflict, like the juxtaposition of the lute playing and dancing with the sadness under a fanciful masked disguise. Some sources have also elaborated on the poem and painting's ethereal quality, mixing hints of despair and sensual delights, as mentioned by Walker in 1972, and just the general idea of masks, disguises, and Arcadian visions of love that only seem to come alive when darkness prevails. It does beg one to question, what is there to hide? From here on, we begin a deconstructing and reconstructing process by asking ourselves questions and reflecting on them in context with the work. Some of these questions include, uh, what are our own masks and what do the presence or lack thereof of these reflect about us and our system? Uh, what is our disguise and what is our true reality? What is the relationship between our public and private selves? And are we much closer to our human desires and psyches when we have a mask on, when there's something to hide behind? In some way or another, perhaps we might even begin to start asking ourselves, what are we searching for? And what are they? What, what is our own fat colant? With these questions in mind, we began to apply a concept as propagated in Raymond Cuno's Exorcist de Steel, a writing technique which seeks to write, tell a story 99 times in 99 different ways. Of course, we don't do this 99 times, but four main exercises guard the execution of this work. The first being a rewrite of translated text to modern day speak for relevancy and modernity. So as you can see here, this section is the original text of Claire de Lune written by Paul Berlin, which WC set. And this is the English translation uh, uh, by Richard Stokes from A French Song Companion. And here we have a rewrite of the English translation, which is done by me. Um, and we kind of readapted it to a more modern pop kind of context, you know, and a more modern usage of language. The second exercise then consists of recreating uh, music material in new styles, which takes into account some melodic elements for Debussy's Claire de Lune and also the text in exercise one. So if you listen carefully later when we play the film, the opening of the synth wave section of Claire de Lune is actually pretty similar to the opening of Debussy's Claire de Lune for Cohesion. And I also kind of sampled that me melodic fragment as a top line riff for the entirety of the song uh, in the synth wave section. The third exercise reimagines a traditionally Western classical performance with sonorities of the new, which includes electronic modifications of the soundscape and also additional synthesizers to support the soundscape. And lastly, we reimagined the work into a film, combining elements um, uh, of traditional methods of presentation of a classical music performance with storyline that pays homage to nostalgia, reflection, and popular culture of the 1980s, a time of great consumerism, which continues to evolve our way of living right now. With that, we come to the execution and presentation of the film, Claire Deline Reimagined, performed by myself, mezzo-soprano Priscilla Fong, and pianist Elizabeth Lowe. But before we begin, Perhaps it might be selling to continue asking ourselves. We are all in search of our own fat galant. What could be yours? Yeah. So could we play the film now? Can we play the film, please? Uh, for the staff, could you play the video, please? Yes. What's wrong? 
Qu'est-ce qui est à toi? Nous recherchons nos fêtes galantes. We are all in search of our fête galante. What is yours? Qu'est-ce qui est à toi? What is yours? What is yours? Nous recherchons nos fêtes galantes. What is yours? What is yours? What is yours? Nous recherchons nos fêtes galantes. Qu'est-ce qui est à toi? What is yours? Thank you so much for playing. Um, uh, so now I would like to invite Stephanie to talk a little bit about the film. Um, she was the uh, create, uh, artistic director and the videographer for the entire film. Stephanie. Hi, everyone. So I'll just like talk a little bit about um, the symbols within the whole film. Um, we used a lot of shadows here to like depict the ambiguity and like finding ourselves, as you see at the start, um, 
And then that kind of transitions into putting on mask in terms of characters. Like we see JJ, like Jing Jie, he's the main character that we're following here throughout the film, right? And we are, he's putting on certain characters, characters from, if you notice the references on 1980s films, like Back to the Future, Breakfast Club and E.T. So all these are like um, symbols of our childhood that we attach ourselves to and, and we try to identify with them. So in some sense, we kind of assume their characters and we are like trying to find out our identities within that. And so as the film progresses, you see the ambiguity come become more and more apparent. And then towards the end, he is taking off all his masks, taking off all his costumes and coming back to find out who he really is. And even at the end, while he is coming back to um, what he was running away from, there's still some sort of ambiguity there, as you can see from the shadows. Yeah. Thank you, Steph. That was very, very well put, very concise, <laughs> a lot better than when, whenever we discussed it. <laughs> so, um, uh, so just to quickly wrap this presentation up, uh, there are a number of further research and educational implications for such an artistic undertaking. And while this project largely, you know, it's still, I mean, it, it could still continue evolving from here on out. Um, and it could still evolve in, in, into many other ways. There might be a live performance element someday, you know, um, and, and for now, this work stands as a film and, and, and we're really happy with it. But also the creation of this work continues to spearhead possibilities in the way we repackage and understand the Western classical music realm, finding greater ways for greater relevance, connection, um, and relation to the actual settings which we have been predisposed in. Such endeavors might also become a possible point of progression of music, changing the way in which music is experienced and perhaps continuously uh, drawing new audiences to newer forms of music. So even in my daily teaching assistant work, you know, leading this project has largely allowed me to see the practical importance of such work, allowing me to harness the experience gained in my daily advisory and student facilitation role. And as a young educator of a music institution, I think there is much of a need to continue guiding the newer generation of musicians towards a more holistic and open way of understanding their identity to engage with music further, deeper and broader to aid in the achievement of greater endeavors. And what better way to do it than to engage in, this, in these evolutionary processes of music ourselves. So yeah, we've come to the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful presentation and for sharing this video, this uh, wonderful performance and music video, which was such a creative synthesis um, of different styles and just really appreciate um, getting to see your work. Uh, you. I really love what you mentioned about innovation being a collaboration and how in our day and age, we it, the interdisciplinary aspect is so important. But then you also highlighted that it was also important in Debussy's time and Debussy was also doing this, um, being inspired by painting and poetry. Yep. So this this concept is not necessarily new, but it's um, it's still with us today and we're yes. able to adapt it into new ways uh, with technology and with our modern culture. And I also love that you brought in to the dialogue uh, the 1980s pop culture and uh, the pop consumerism, which I think is goes along so well with uh, with the song with uh, that you chose. And I I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about uh, Do you think it's important um, to start with traditional music or classical music such as Debussy as a starting point? And what role do you think that has in shaping new new music of today? Well, I don't think there is a uh, very, um, I, think, I think the answer is not the end all. I think like there are many relevant starting points. I think this was just one of the starting points in which we decided to uh, devote ourselves to because as classical, as trained classical musicians, we are most familiar sometimes with the classical canon. And um, there are, there will be works that kind of encapsulate or captivate us a little bit more than others. And this was actually one such example. Um, I, I, uh, I personally think that there is great value, you know, in, in, in having classical music as a starting point as we are able to kind of relook into history a little bit and relook into the ways in which history has constructed itself in terms of how we understand music today. But I think at the same time, we should also be aware that, you know, um, we don't have to let history repeat it itself all the time. You know, we could technically 
always, you know, seek to, you know, break out of it, you know, break out of these structures and break out of these conventions every now and then. Um, and, and, and it might possibly even, you know, be a greater representation of who we are in today's context, given that we are quite different from the VC's time. And also, I mean, um, given that this film was done in 2021, we, all, we are also quite different, you know, from the 1980s, even, even if all these different elements still continue to guard, you know, a large part of our musical activity and, and musical dynamics like up till now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I guess just thinking about young people today or young people who want to study music, um, yeah. do you think it's important for them to have training in, in classical music? Um, yeah, I'm just, yeah, you were saying that it, it can be approached in different ways, yeah. right? But, um, yeah, do you think it's, it's important to understand the background of Western music and especially living in Singapore in this region? Yeah. Uh, do you find that it's relevant? I think there is certainly relevance in a sense whereby classical music, you know, it's one of the many genres of music we have out of there. So in a sense where it is important because it is part of history in some way or another. I think the way in which I view classical music as a whole is that it is just one of the other genres of music that I have engaged in, you know, since I was a kid, you know, and I was very well aware that, you know, other genres of classical tra traditions also exist. Um, and, and that, you know, the classical music perspective, uh, the Western classical music perspective of things is not everything and it's not the only, you know, way in which we can understand ourselves or, or uh, um, enjoy music, for example. Um, so I think while there, while, you know, it might be good for, you know, younger musicians to engage themselves in Western classical music, um, because it does kind of seem that formalized knowledge in music tends to kind of incline itself that way. Um, but I don't think it should be treated as a, uh, as, a, as a means to an end, you know? I think, you know, while we understand music in a certain way, I think there's a lot of room where we can start to experiment with understanding music in different forms. So in the greater, grander scheme of things where if we're talking about finding, you know, a, a background, you know, of understanding music, Yes, Western classical music is an important aspect, but it is not any more or less important than any other kinds of traditions, you know? And I think if, for example, music education starts to incorporate all these different elements together, you know, I think it might create a more holistic and a more relevant um, connection with the younger audiences, with younger musicians. And even for myself, you know, I, I uh, having been classically trained, you know, Western classically trained all my life, um, I, I can't deny that there was a little bit of a, you know, strange um, sense of a miss, you know, somewhere along the way, you know, it's, it's that you understand the music and you understand where it comes from, but it might not necessarily stick or, or align with you necessarily all the time because, and, and I think when I reflected upon it, it was really because I realized it came from something that maybe I was not very aware of, maybe I wasn't very... Um, uh, connected to because it just didn't really feel like a culture of my own. And I think there's also another added layer of complexity in Singapore, especially because um, the, the whole thing about the East meets the West, you know, here in Singapore, we, we embrace that quite a bit. And, and that kind of creates some level of confusion, um, but it's nonetheless still very fun and interesting to kind of unpack that. And also, I guess, in, in this sense, do it, you know, in, in the form of music. Yeah, wonderful. Um, Stephanie, did you have anything to add? No, I just totally agree with that. Um, being classically trained just doesn't mean that we only know how to do classical music or that we should only do classical music. Um, every genre is as important as the other and there's within disciplines as well. Like we have to learn to not be musicians, but to be artists as a whole, to see it in, uh, with an artist's eye instead of just like, how can I make music better? But instead, like, how can I make the experience of music better? Yeah, so I like, totally agree with everything that Zintia just said. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. So I think you're giving us kind of a new vision of what music can be, that it's yes. not just something isolated or just music by itself, but it can be integrated in a way that's meaningful to our times and also using also other uh, disciplines and art forms to enhance the message. So thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank for you. Us. Thank you.
All right, next. Um, our next speaker is a fourth year student at PGVIM, violinist Gritea Lori Pianon, will speak about revolutionary aspects of Rockberg's caprice variations for unaccompanied violin. Thank you, Watson Hin. And I um, also totally agree with everything Wolfgang just said about that. I really like that and it very inspired me. So I really love it. Just let you know. Okay. Let me share screen. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Kritya Lopianon. I am violinist and what year student of PGV. Um, today I'm going to present about the revolutionary aspects of Rockberg's caprice variations for an accompanied violin. So music is constantly being revolutionized by variables such as social change, innovation, and wars. These variables can result in changing styles, evolving philosophies, and new instrument technologies. Despite these advances, however, composers of each era often draw ideas or inspiration from composers of the past. In this way, revolution and tradition are linked together. And let's know Josh Rockford first. Josh Rockberg is a composer from the 20th century who often borrowed materials from composers of past centuries. He composed new music using old ideas, combining elements from the past with new compositional techniques. Rockberg was interested in every genre of music and his writing reflects his wide range of interest in varying styles. Rockberg started out as a serialist composer Initially fully embraced serial music was influenced by Italian serial composer Luigi Dalla Piccola. Prof. Bagatelle's for piano solo in 1951 was his first serial work. But in 1964, he lost his father and his son. Afterward, he rejected serialism and returned to writing in a tonal idiom in response to trauma he experienced. And this is a question, why did Rockberg reject serialism? According to this quote, I couldn't breathe anymore. I needed air. I was tired of the same round of manipulating the pitches vertically and horizontally. What I finally realized was that there were no cadences, that you can't come to a natural pause, that you can't write a musical comma, colon, semicolon, dash, for dramatic expressive purposes, or to enclose a thought. Apparently, Rockberg speaks of feeling suffocated with a tonality after he acknowledged the existence of serialism. Rockberg could hear the serialism for a moment of time. Afterward, he realized that telephone is not the right language he was looking for. Um, Caprice variations for an accompanied violin is a garden of all sorts of possibilities that I am exploring briefly through the variations on Paganini. There are non-tonal things, there are tonal things. That was musically the real turning point. These variations were Rockberg's first composition after his shift to writing tonal music. They contain both tonal and atonal variations. And he also quote music from other composers from many different eras and assimilated them into his music. His decision to return to a tonal writing style made him different from other composers in his times. Rockberg was very, was very bold-minded to refuse a tonality with other composers were exploring. He understood and accepted many different styles and embraced a pluralistic view of music, unifying them with his quotations. In doing so, he arguably paved, paved the way for modernism. And um, this variations contains 51 variations, including the theme. Rockberg used the technique of art combinatoria, which is the combination of music from different composers. Rockberg provided definitions of art combinatoria in this way, in his way. He gave a definition of art combinatoria in two, two, two things. The first thing is opposite words in the same work. And the second thing is standing in a circle of time not aligned which I think Rockberg was traveling in a circle in which he could see music from the past, not only going forward. 
This helps to explain not only his cultivation of stylistic pluralism, but also his goals for the listener to connect his works by incorporating within the contemporary world, both the past and the present. Um, to remind us the theme before we go to the Rockberg Caprice, I would like to introduce the Paganini's Caprice Dream first. Okay, so for this piece, I divided into two categories, which are quoting variations and non-quoting variations. And for non-quoting variations, I also divided into three categories, which are Baroque-like, style of 19th century, and style of 20th century. The first one, quoting variations, I'll begin with number seven, which takes a quotation from Beethoven's Opus 74 Scherzo. Rockberg used the rhythm from the first part of Beethoven's Spring Quartet No. 10, Opus 74, Third Movement. Rockberg transposed from C minor to A minor, according to Paganini's Caprice 2014. In the first part, Rockberg didn't change anything but key signature. But for the second part, Rockberg changed the frequency between the dotted quarter note with the eight notes and eight note passage to follow the chord progression in Paganini's theme. So you can see the, the similarity of this path. So let's hit the recording. Okay, this is Beethoven and let's hear off works. Okay, for the next variation is number eight. For number eight, Rockwell quotes from Schubert's Walls, num Opus 9, number 22. Rockwell transposed Schubert's Walls into A minor. In the second part, Rockwell applied register to separate melody and harmony, featuring the melody in higher register in a softer dynamic, and outlining the harmonic progression in the lower strings in a stronger dynamic. So, okay, let's hear the recording so you can compare it. And this is Rockberg's.
not only the notes, but Rockwell also copy the form from the Schubert was also. So this is very interesting for me. It's not only the note. Great. Um, next is number 12. Rockwell called the music from Brown's Oration in the theme of Paganini, Opus 35, number 12. Rockwell took the left hand part of this variation, which is originally written in the treble place. Rockwell literally didn't change anything but octave for variant appropriate. And he added console to imitate piano sound. Okay, let's hear it. Okay, and this is rock books. Rockberg quoted a lot of Brahms music, especially Brahms variation in theme of Paganini. So I've never seen any composer, composer quote the, the music that quote from the, the main theme again, just like quote in quote to make his new piece. So I think this is very unique for Rockberg also. And with next is not quoting variations. I begin with Baroque-like variations. Number two, Rockberg used a lot of repeated notes and added accents in the first note of each phrase. Reminds me of Vivaldi's Concerto Number Two in G Minor, Summer in Presto, and Bach Sonata Number Three in E Major Preludio. The contrast between high and low register created the melody line. This technique mostly appeared in Baroque music. In my opinion, Rockberg might have gotten some ideas from Rockberg from Baroque composers such as Bach and Vivaldi to create this variation. So you see the repeated note here and here in Vivaldi. Um, let's hear the recording so you can hear it properly. Okay, and this is Vivaldi. Okay, and this is Bach, Padida. Okay, and you see Rockberg also used a lot of open E string on violin, like Bach, and Bach also pop up the melody line from every note. So I think this is the similarity with Bach and Rockberg. Sorry. <laughs> and next is Baruch-like number three. 
Variation three has most common has a common pattern as the second variation. The difference is Strasberg included more codes and intervals in this variation. So I think of these two variations as a set. As a set. This pattern, this the pattern of this variation is alternating between codes and intervals, which reminds me of some parts of Bach Chacon. Okay, let's hear the recording. Okay, and this is Bach Chacon. Okay, um, you hear the, the violin like playing on string and I choose the Baroque instrument because it's effect to, to play on string. And if you will hear this part, Bach used time signature in full throw actually, but the sense of three was shown off as well as this variation. Rochberg wrote the chords in every strong beat. So I include this variation in the Baroque like. Okay, next is style of 19th century variation number 24. Rockberg perhaps quote music from Brahms or in Concerto in D major opus 77, together with Paganini were in Concerto number one opus six in third movement. Rockberg used the contour from Paganini's concerto, then added left hand pizzicato instead of ricochet in 30 second notes. And in the upper part, Rockberg used the contour from Brown's concerto to provide some contrast. Rockberg wrote Dolce in the upper part to emphasize the contrast. So you see this, the red square and the left hand pizzicato and the tranquilo here. It's quite similar to this part. So you hear the recording. And use Paganini. Okay, this is an idea. And this is Brahms. So you hear the ricochet in the Rockberg, Rockberg variations also. So I assume that the player must know that Rockberg quote some part from Paganini's. So I think this is an important thing that we have to learn Western music to apply with the new music in, in this century. Um, next is style in 19th century, variation 48. This variation includes signs, oh, sorry. Number 19, Rockberg wrote this variation in style similar to Stravinsky, Rite of Spring, Sacrificial Dance. Metrical changes appear and also repeating rhythmic motif. The sequence of notes repeating include the tempo. I'm so, so sorry, your slide. Uh, sorry. It's number 25, okay, so I'm so sorry about that.
Okay, okay. So sorry, so sorry about that. <laughs> Number 25, Robert, borrow some idea. Maybe borrow some idea from Isaiah Solo in Sonata. Number three, Ballad. Robert amplify the notes from 32nd notes into six and 16 notes into dotted quarter notes and eight notes. The shape of pitches are quite similar, which are down and up or over the variation. And also the accents, which are nearly in the same beat as Isaiah. So let's say the recording. And this is Hisai. Okay, move on. Um, for number nineteen. This is style of 20th century. Proper wrote this variation in style similar to Stravinsky, Rite of Spring, Sacrificial Dance. Metrical changes appear and also re repeating rhythmic motif. The sequence of notes repeating include the tempo. So you see the metrical change very obvious and uh, compare with the recording. Okay, and let's move on to right off screen. It's very rhythmic, and you can hear that. Okay, let's go next. Um, the last one, this variation number 20, uh, number 48, this variation includes signs and words that previous notes and why the dynamic could be compared with Bella Bartok. Rockwell perhaps got some melody and technique from Bartok Berlin Sonata number two. So you can see the pizzicato and a lot of words and dynamic changes and also crescendo, which I compare with Bartok Berlin Sonata number two. Okay, let's hear the recording. I divide into two clips. So let's hear this first. And this is Bella Batok. You hear the crescendo and let me change this. Okay, next. This part you will hear the extremely jumping note. And this is about talk. Um, okay, let's move on to conclusion. Rockbox reject of serial music directly affected his compositional style as he turned instead to the tonal system and his idea of art combinatoria, which he believed was able to connect the people. These variations demonstrate a pluralistic view of music by incorporating music from other composers alongside original music by Rockberg. Harpy's versions for an accompanied violin demonstrate Rockberg's musical ideas. This piece has both a tonal and tonal variations as Rockwell fully embraced every genre of music. These variations were a turning point 
for rock birth. By gathering music from the past and the present, he paved the way for music of the future, allowing for a variety of styles to be united in composition. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for this presentation. And very nice to learn about this piece. Uh, I think what we're seeing so far this morning is a melange of different styles being able to coexist in one work. Um, and even Rockberg's piece, which was written in 1970, is that right? 1970, um, I believe it was that you presented. Uh, that's already 50 years ago, yeah. Uh, but it's interesting how the mindset had started to change that we can incorporate so many different styles into one work, um, as we've seen also from our two presentations this morning, combining ideas of East and West, and also the past and the present, and so many different cultures. And so I think this is a very interesting case study um, uh, as one piece that explores so many different genres uh, and traditions of uh, playing both on the violin and also classical music in general. So interesting how he incorporates Paganini's music also with other compositions. Um, so I, I'm kind of wondering, well, more commenting that it seems like this piece, because if we think about the solo violin repertoire or solo violin caprices, usually they're featuring the performer, right? If they're featuring virtuosity or uh, instrumental technique. But this piece, I don't know, what, what is your perspective? Do you think this piece is also featuring the performer as a technician or is it more highlighting compositions? Um, I think composition is a very minor thing for, for this piece. It's like um, Rockberg quote from many composers and a lot of music in this piece. I think the perspective of performer to like to get other like each of variations is very important to like to perform this piece. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's very important to like to to know which were each variations very clear to to play it in in the right articulation in the right like in the right right form in the right way yeah and what about for the listener do you think it is necessary or important for the listener to be aware of all of these different references that he's making mm, for me it's important like you understand each variation um, when you can understand Baroque music, classical music, or like 20th century, so you can so you can compare and can gather everything together, and to understand music very well. Yeah. So I wonder if this piece is intended for an audience uh, that really has an in-depth knowledge of classical music, because I think he's quoting not only general styles, but also very specific pieces. So to be able to get those references may be difficult, even for a person in classical music, um, just because there are so many of them. It's uh, 50 variations, is it? Um, yes, 51 variations, including 51. the theme. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I wonder, uh, do you have any ideas on how to program this piece, or if you had to perform this, um, would you have any preparation for the audience or how would you go about programming it? Mm, I would categorize, yeah, I will use my category to perform it because it's very various. Let's begin with Baroque or maybe, or we have Beethoven, which is the classical and revolutionary to the romantic style. Bell Bartok also, and 20th century and 19th century also important music for for like to for know and for understand them. So I will choose my category to like perform. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Yeah, so great to learn about this piece and this stylistic melange and this dialogue between so many different styles. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you to you too. Okay, so our final speaker this morning is my colleague and faculty here at PGVIM. 
pianist Chanya Pong Tong Sawang. Dr. Tong Sawang's topic today is Prasit Silapa Ban Leng and his advisor Klaus Pringsheim, cross-cultural transfer and transition from Thai traditional to European classical music. Good morning, everybody. May I start my presentation with the video presentation, a short one. Please let me know if uh, you cannot hear the sound. So that was the one of the most famous piece by Ajahn Prasit Silapa Baleng Sai Sampan, mean relations from his critical plate. Prasit Silapa Baleng, a prominent Thai composer and national artist, 1988, was born in 1912 into a Thai musical family. He was trained from his childhood in traditional Thai music by his father, Luang Pradit Thai Rock, Son Silapa Baleng a legendary master of Thai music. Before his further study in composition at the Imperial Academy of Music, Geta University, Tokyo in Japan, between 1935 to 37, under the supervision of German professor Klaus Prinzheim. Klaus Prinzheim, a German composer and conductor, was born in 1883 in Munich. He moved to Vienna in 1906 and was a repetitor at the Hof Oper in Vienna and became assistant of Gustav Mahler, who once mentioned Prince um, as his student in a letter to Thomas Mann, Prince Ham's brother in law. In 1923 to 24, Prince Ham conducted the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra, the premier performance of the Mahler cycle in Berlin, including Mahler's complete symphonies and songs with the orchestra. Prince Hans also had a relation to Richard Strauss, at least one of Prince Hans' compositions in the concert. In 1931, Prince Han was invited to teach at the Imperial Academy of Music in Tokyo, and then moved to Bangkok in 1937 to work as a music advisor to the Department of Fine Arts before returning to Japan in 1939. <laughs> Inspired by Asian culture, Prince Han wrote transcriptions on Japanese and Thai songs for instrumental music as well as for orchestra. During his service in Bangkok in 1938, he arranged Sayami songs by Luang Vichit Watakan for orchestra as well as for violin and piano, entitled Sayami's Melodies, Suite for Violin and Piano, Opus 37. This song cycle consists of five songs, Just a Dream, Kwam Fun, Take My Flower, Chen Chom Dok Mai, Player, Vinyan Sanvi, Far Away, Kitting Takai, and The Moon, Duong Chan. Prince Han 
also organized a concert in Japan with a performance of Siamese songs as he wrote a letter to Ajahn Francis Silapa Ballet on 28th of May, 1940 from Tokyo. Citations. On my advice, Mr. Takami will sing in his vocal concert a number of songs by Luang Wichit Watakan in Siamese language. Three from Princess Sandy, two or three from the Black of Supak. Now I would like to compare the original recording of the moon, Duong Chan, and the orchestral arrangement by Prince Han. The moon is a theme song from the play Blood of Supan, Lyot Supan, a treasurable work of nationalist propaganda for achieving peace between Myanmar and Thailand. It was premiered in 1936 by only female actress as common in that time. Prapai Kanchana Pokin played the main male role as a Myanmar soldier, Mang Rai, while Suwana Suwana Son as a main actress named Duong Chan. The original recording is from the Audion recording label. I want to show you from the YouTube. This is the original recording. This is So now I want to show you the orchestral versions was composed and performed by the Royal Bangkok Orchestra under the baton of Klaus Prince Han. So now we can see the score of the moon, an orchestral score, and a piece for violin and piano arranged by Klaus Prince Han. Compared to the historical recording of the original songs, Prince Han noted simple tunes for violin part accompanied by a piano with dense polyphonic textures and the use of chromatic chords. In the late Roman, in the late German Romantic style, in the score he also deliberately indicates musical expressions and tempo markings. Since Thai songs of this era were not normally noted in such detail, this long forgotten arrangement is an especially important written source for these Siamese songs. 
from the recording, the orchestral version is much slower than the, the vocal original recording. It's a little bit too slow, and we can see a lot of uh, chromatic progressions this Pringham present. It is a problematic to use typical Western harmony to harmonize the original pentatonic tune. As we can learn from example of De La Bartok's arrangement of Hungarian and Romanian folk music, Prince Ham applied chromatic chords, suspension note, and borrowed chord, which happened more than usual, to create ambitious tonality. He managed the phrase by dividing it into consonants, dissonance, and consonant. Clear tonal function at the beginning and ending. Free harmonically in the middle. He also used chromatic, eventually combined with diatonic parallel movements to make the harmony in the middle of the phrase more ambiguous. The result, although the music is harmonically conceived, sounds more polyphonic. The ambiguities of harmony after the beginning of a phrase reminds me of techniques used by the late Roman, the late German Romantic and French Impressionist composers. Inherit the compositional technique from his advisor, Ajahn Prasisilabha Baleng, combined classical compositional techniques such as harmonic progression and orchestration of Western instruments with Thai traditional characters and pentatonic melodies. How Ajahn Prasit had studied four part harmony and chromatic progression, one can see from an example of his homework for Prince Han. Here is the, we suppose as a homework that Ajahn Prasit wrote a four part harmony with quite complex harmony, I would say, and with the chromatic progressions. Da, 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 da. And here, uh, I, I think Professor Prince Han wrote stupid here. Actually, it was not that too, stu uh, too stupid, I would say, that for our bachelor student might be confused also, is an enharmonic note. Instead of E, he wrote F flat. Instead of G sharp, he wrote A flat, which is the same tone, but uh, it, it's wrong for the theory. It's really wrong. Furthermore, Ajahn Prasit Silabak Baleng transformed Thai traditional music by his father into classical orchestral masterpiece, including Sien Tian, Dam Dan Sai, and Chert Nai. He also composed Siamisvi, consisting of four movements, Moon Over the Temple, In the Grand Palace, Siamis Lamin, and In Bangkok's Chinatown, to present Thai art and culture. Ajahn Prasit Silapa Baleng wrote the first movement during his study with Prince Han in Japan. And later by 1954, at the other three movements, the Siamese Suite was premiered at the UNESCO Music Conference in Manila, the Philippines, in 1954. Influenced by classical state play, Opera and Western musicals, Ajahn Prasit composed theatrical play in the fruitful period between 1947 to 51 with his wife, Lakda Silabha Baleng, for Patavali theatrical troupe, which include singers, dancers, and around 16 musicians with Western instruments. Similar to classical program music, Richard Strauss symphony poem, a leader with an orchestra. Ajahn Prasit in illustrate the story of the play through orchestra sounds relevant to the meaning of lyrics. For example, for example, in the introduction of Ngau Nai Nam, Shadow in the Water, he imitates pastoral-like nature sound with a flute solo, which reminds me of the introduction of Riley Jensen's from this 
ครับเป็นบุญธรรมไปคือสัมมาเลยรายลิจันชันอิสทอลกิ้งอุตสาหกรรมในเยอรมนีแอสเกิลอินสติพิคนุ่มบิวตี้ฟูลเนเจอร์ may I show you may I put open the music for you The beginning of ngau nai nam. It was sung by Savali Pakapan, a legendary Thai singer who has just passed away. Another example is Kwam Suk, uh, Happiness. He composed it with a large orchestra uh, in E-flat major. For me, when I listen to this, it reminds me of uh, Richard Wagner, Lohengrin, at the beginning in the prelude, beginning with the tonic chord, and then come the the sixth chord in minor. It's a beautiful character at the beginning. I'll show you an example. Next example from a jump process is Rock Pair to Love, also with the orchestra, which also with harp. Um, I would, would like to compare two recording. The first one by legendary singers Savali Pakapan and Adire. 
จันโรม and the next one which the classic singers อาจารย์ใจรัตน์พิทักษ์เจริญ and ดรกรวิทย์เทพพัสดี to compare between the old versions and the new versions the same piece It was the excerpt of To Love, r a k p a from the play n g o k p a sung by uh, the first one sung by s a v a l i p a k a p a n and Adirek j a n r o n g j a n r e n g from 1950. The next one, uh, the, the second one sung by Ajahn Jai Rat, p i t a k c h a r e n and Dr. Gorvit t e p a k s d i n accompanied by the Latvian National Orchestra under the baton of Thierry m i k e l s e n Both singers, k o r o v i t and a j a n j a r a t were trained as classical singer. Um, we can see the traditions in transition from the legendary singer of Luk Krung to the new generation of singers with classical vocal technique. However, a j a n p r a s i t would imagine his songs sung with the classical voice. Uh, as he admired how Ajahn Jai Rat interpret his music, both Ajahn Jai Rat and k o r v i t e m has been uh, were trained by Ajahn l a b d a Silaba b a l i n g how to pronounce uh, the words and how, with some 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 technique or how to u n like some on do some ornamentation in the lyrics. And but although we could hear. Different sound quality from from the from the singers from the past and now the singers with the classical technique. It has some we can feel different atmosphere from from the feelings. In the 21st century, new arrangement of Thai music have been emerging in various form with support of innovations to suit. The audience and social circumstance. My further project is to arrange selected song by a j a n p r a s i s i l a p a b a l e for voice with piano accompaniment, eventually with some melody instruments 
to be more flexible, to perform at a live concert event and online platform. To summarize my research, the studies of the relations between Ajahn Francis Silva Balay and his mentor Klaus Prince Han. <clears throat> describes how European musicians interpret Thai mu traditional music with their artistic approach and how Thai artists combine classical compositional technique and Thai traditional characters in their creative works. This cross-cultural transfer also shows the, tra the traditions in transitions of interpretations and compositional style, which always develops in each period. Uh, special thanks to Dr. Kulaton Silva Baleng and Dr. Ralph Eisinger for providing me uh, useful information about Ajahn Francis Silva Baleng and Klaus Prinsham. Also, the archive of Ajahn Francis Silva Baleng, organized by Dr. Kulaton and Ajahn Pasini, that is very useful uh, digital archive to research on Ajahn Prasit Silva Balay and also for his compositions. You can find a lot of recordings, pictures, document, letters there. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Thank you for this presentation. This was wonderful. Um, so, so nice to know about this kind of cultural exchange that was happening um, between these two composers and yeah, even from such an early time, this uh, uh, cross-cultural dialogue between Thailand and Germany and Western music and how that really influenced these two artists um, with their creative work. I, I really liked from your presentation when you were speaking about harmony as being uh, ha having to be adapted to the Thai melody. So that for me really summarizes uh, the concept of this dialogue, right, or this compromise, um, having to uh, two two different cultures having interaction with one another. So that's the harmony, Western harmony, and Thai melody. Uh, in your opinion, uh, because also this morning earlier we had a presentation about uh, Ravel Azi and how this is a piece that was written by a Western composer, but it was inspired by some fantasies of Asia. Um, in your opinion, working the other way around, uh, is what dimension, if any, do you think Western music or Western harmony adds to Thai music? Yeah, I think it's a very interesting task to do that. Uh, for instance, we can also adapt the Western harmony into Thai tradition, but maybe we have some limit. It depends on the, our scale system. Yeah, if the instrument can play only pentatonic, so we have limited to perform uh, chromatic uh, scales. But uh, for 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 example, for Ranat, we can maybe we, if we can tune with the diatonic, we can perform with the triangle instrument. And for I would say if we perform an opera or or step play from from classical style, it I, for me it's possible to adapt the chronography with the Thai cultures or Asian culture. Just we use the same philosophy as the original one, but adapt with, with, with the, our culture to be more easily to perceive from, from our audience. Yeah, I think it's possible. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah because for theoretical play, we have both uh, sound and visual to perceive and to understand. Right. And are these plays often performed today? Or where can we see these plays? Um, the original play is, as far as I know, it haven't been performed for, for a long time. Yeah, maybe since, I don't know, the Second World War or something like that. But the music, let's say the theme song, uh, we, we can still hear till today, yeah. And, but, there are not so many chance to perform in our orchestra versions. That's why I plan to arrange for the chamber works so that we can have more chance to perform and it can be more flexible to organize. However, I still think that 
it would be great if we can bring these theater play to perform again nowadays, maybe with some modern interpretations or with some innovation for the visuals. Yeah. That's yeah, I think that would be. Yeah, I think there are a lot of possibilities now also with some of the other presentations that we've seen and um, ideas that people are having of interdisciplinary works and combining uh, combining different traditions from different times. Um, even this music is combining traditional Thai music, uh, but with music from the 20th century. So that itself is its own tradition in a way different from our time. So I, I really like this um, kind of exchange between all periods of time and also in our day that we have such a wide possibility for uh, interdisciplinary creative works. And yeah. And especially the, these works that are connected with theater and the play, uh, I think there's a lot of potential um, to make a really wonderful new production. So we really hope that this will develop further. Professor Lyat Supan, the Blood of Supan by Luong Vichit Vatakan, it was uh, performed with a new interpretation, uh, like a modern invasion. And I think it, it was success, yeah, to, to replay it, yeah, as the, in the, for European opera, classical opera, some, some forgotten piece uh, haven't performed for many, many years, right? And they revise them and perform again with some new choreography. That is very nice because the music is very beautiful and the story is also very nice as well. I was about to ask, do you, do you think that these stories have relevance uh, to our modern day? Uh, I think we can we can we can explain to our modern day because it's like when we when we read a Thai poem or Thai literature from the past, we can also imagine and and we can absorb our rich culture mm -hmm. by watching these uh, historical plays. Yeah. Yeah, certainly, and that's the theme of our week, our symposium week, discovering how the past is influencing us. Mm -hmm. We learn from the past and give you create something new with the evidence that we has learned that. But it doesn't. We, I don't say that we copy from the past and just do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. We're using it as a springboard to develop ourselves further and to learn learn more about the world. Um, yeah. As I understand, we have an important guest with us in the audience. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I believe Dr. From my, from my screen, I cannot see the audience, but if Dr. Kulaton Silapa Baleng is with us here, would you like to share some opinion with us? A son of Ajahn Prasit Silapa Baleng. Maybe you can open your microphone if you want to say something. Hello. I have been watching your presentation with great interest and thank you for having presented very nicely the works of my father and of course his mentor, Professor Klaus Brisheim. Uh, I don't know uh, what can I add to your presentation because it seems to me that you have covered almost all the uh, important items uh, about his compositional, about my father's, let, my late father's compositional, compositional, compositional work, sorry. <laughs> uh, if you ask me, of course, I will try to answer. Um, maybe it just uh, our Morita has asked that from Kavali, would it be possible to to perform again? Oh yes, of course. Uh, the play of 1942-1943 with this, uh, I would say, romantic classical music in the play can be can be reintroduced yeah. that, that as a present day uh, play, and of course uh, you can keep it in its original form or you can adapt it to suit with the time that has been elapsed for almost 50 or 60 years. Yes, I think both ways you can do it, providing that you maintain the original score 
of the music. Yes. Yeah, yeah. How long? How long does it take around for for one play around? Oh, I would say, uh, if you do it originally, mm. it would take almost two hours. Uh-huh. Almost two hours. Yes, almost two hours. Yes. Mm. But maybe we can do it like in a shortened way, like a scene. Yes. 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 Yeah. Uh, I think I think you need to have someone who specializes. Uh, both, you know, in the, as a playwright to yeah. shorten the play, keeping all the in, uh, important part of it, you know, yeah. but you can shorten it. Uh, but for the music, I think in each play, my father composed about three or four songs mm. to be sung by the actresses, you mm. see, and actors. So, but if you keep that, one song lasts about three or four minutes. So it could be very well fitted into a modern day adapted play. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Rez, for for um, commentary. Yeah. 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 yeah thank you. Thank you very much for presenting the words of my late father. Yeah. I greatly appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. I I I shall research on the story of of the, the play and new thing for the further project for the reproductions of. And you also play into modern interpretation, but with regard uh, to the, the original music from a chapter. I look forward to seeing and listening to that. Thank you, Dr. Sanjapong. Thank you very much, Associate, Pro- Doc- Associate Professor Dr. Tulat Consila Bakali. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and. Yes, I, I look forward as well to seeing a potential adaptation of these works. And so I think that wraps up our session today. Thank you to all the participants who joined and apologies for going a bit over time. Um, so we do have some sessions in the afternoon and we hope that you can join us. And we'll have studies, transition to students recital, and also a parallel panel discussion as the Youth Ensemble Beyond Borders. We have a break now, and and thank you again for joining us today. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.